Uh, welcome, everyone, to CEPR, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm thrilled to have Lena Khan, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, with us here at Stanford today. And a big thank you to the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford and to the Business, Government, and Society Initiative for co-sponsoring today's event with us here at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, or CEPR. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and it's, a great, it's great to host all of you in our building. As our name suggests, our research focuses on economic policy in the US and around the world. So it's a tremendous honor and especially fitting to have one of the country's top policymakers with us here today. And I know that our affiliated scholars and students, as well as those at the business school, will find this event particularly relevant. The recent actions and policies of the FTC surrounding its approach to big tech have drawn both praise and criticism from many directions. Long before her appointment to lead the FTC in 2021, Chair Khan has argued for more regulation of some of the world's largest technology companies. When she was a student at Yale Law School in 2017, the Yale Law Journal published a piece that she wrote explaining how US antitrust laws needed to change in order to rein in the growing influence of big tech companies. The piece helped spur a great deal of academic research and policy debate and contributed to what's been called an antitrust revolution. Her efforts really came to a head back in September when the FTC, joined by 17 states, sued Amazon. The agency in the states, which notably do not include California, say Amazon's actions allow it to stop rivals, and, this, and I quote, say, quote, Amazon's actions allow it to stop rivals and sellers from lowering prices, degrade quality for shoppers, overcharge sellers, stifle innovation, and prevent rivals from fairly competing against Amazon. While the Amazon lawsuit has garnered a lot of headlines, it's certainly not the first time the FTC has taken a company to court during Chair Khan's term. The agency has sued to block uh, a number of mergers and acquisitions, some of which have also been in the headlines. And there's been plenty of recognition of her efforts, including her FTC's efforts to constrain non-compete clauses that the FTC argues make workers much less mobile and may unfairly lock them into jobs. Her scholarship has been praised by the New York Times as having reframed decades of monopoly law, and by Politico has called her a leader of a new school of antitrust thought. Opponents argue that the FTC under Chair Khan has been overreaching far beyond its own regulatory authority. So I think that we're in for a very interesting conversation today about recent changes in antitrust policy and how that imp impacts innovation and other things that we care about. How the FTC and the Biden administration are looking at moves being made by big tech companies and what this all potentially means for businesses and consumers. The game plan for today is as follows. Chair Khan will present for about 12 or so minutes. I'll then ask a few questions, and then I'll open it up to the audience for your questions. When you ask a question, please give your name and your affiliation. And I've definitely got to make sure that, I, that we get at least one question from a student, but I think I'm, I'm not too worried about that here today. Uh, before we get started, I want to share a bit more about Lena's background. My daughter, Lena, is very excited that there's another Lena here at CEPR today, so I wish she was here. But she's 15, and I don't know, anyway, she's not. But before we get started, I want to share some more about Lena's background. She was sworn into her position as chair of the FTC on June 15, 2021, making her the youngest person to ever hold the job. Before heading the FTC, she was an associate professor of law at Columbia Law School. She also served as counsel to the U.S. House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law, legal advisor to FTC Commissioner Rohit Chopra, and legal director at the Open Markets Institute. With that, let me once again thank our friends at the Graduate School of Business and the Business, Government, and Society Initiative for making today's event possible. And thank you also to all of the amazing CEPR and GSB staff who helped make this event and others go so smoothly. And please join me in welcoming uh, Chair Lena Khan to Stanford. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks so much to CEPR and the Business School for hosting me here today. Uh, I'm so glad to, to be here, and in particular, be here at Stanford University, uh, which for decades has been such a key catalyst of research and innovation. Over 50 years ago, not too far from here, a group of pioneers built out the world's first microprocessors. 
Their ingenuity and grit helped launch a semiconductor sector that would give Silicon Valley its name and transform the world. In the decades since, Silicon Valley has been home to countless breakthrough technologies that have delivered enormous benefits and helped position the United States as a global leader of innovation. At its best, Silicon Valley represents America's endless sense of possibility, a place where tinkerers and visionaries, startups and entrepreneurs, against all odds and through sheer hustle, strive to bring their ideas to life and make the world a better place. Many people have tried to explain what has accounted for Silicon Valley's success. One explanation that caught my ear recently was offered by investor Bill Gurley at a conference a few weeks back. He talked about the relationship between dominant companies and government regulation and shared several stories laying out how powerful firms have used their influence in the past to tilt laws and regulation in their favor, often at the expense of smaller companies and the public good. The reason Silicon Valley has been so successful, he concluded, is because it's so effing far away from Washington, DC. <laughs> it was a provocative observation, uh, one that I want to use as a jumping off point for my remarks today. How should we understand the relationship between Washington, DC and Silicon Valley, or more broadly, between government and America's entrepreneurs and innovators? One of my former predecessors, the late former FTC chairman, Robert Potofsky, once said that if you're gonna let the free market work, you'd better protect the free market. He was absolutely right. Part of protecting the free market is ensuring that market outcomes, who wins and who loses, is determined by fair competition rather than by private gatekeepers who can serve as de facto private regulators. Protecting open and competitive markets means that the best ideas win. It means that businesses get ahead by competing on the merits of their skills, not by exploiting special privileges or bowing to incumbent monopolists. The antitrust laws and the FTC were established to ensure just that. I'll offer that it is this commitment to free enterprise and fair competition that has allowed the United States to harness the talents and ingenuity of its citizens reap breakthrough innovations, and lead as an economic powerhouse. Our history is replete with examples of how government action to protect free and fair competition has been a key driver of growth and innovation. When most people think of antitrust action against AT&T, they think of the lawsuit that resulted in the 1982 breakup of the Bell system. But an equally important action by the Justice Department was its 1956 consent decree with AT&T, which allowed the company to stay vertically integrated, but required the firm to license its existing patents on a royalty-free basis. In practice, this meant that critical technologies held by Bell Labs became available to all US companies. Empirical research shows that the consent decree unleashed waves of follow-on innovation driven by young and small companies that were able to build on Bell Labs technologies. There was also the DOJ's antitrust lawsuit against IBM, which charged the firm with slowing the growth of data processing companies. As then CEO Thomas Watson Jr. wrote, IBM's old practice had been to lump everything together in a single process, hardware, software, engineering, help, maintenance, and even training sessions. As a response to DOJ's lawsuit, IBM unbundled its hardware, software, and services and allowed firms to freely pick and choose. The government action that most directly accounts for Silicon Valley's phenomenal growth over the last two decades traces back to 1998, when federal enforcers sued Microsoft for violating the antitrust laws. The action directly responded to startups, including those in Silicon Valley, who had called foul on Microsoft for tactics designed to lock out new firms that threatened its monopoly. Critically, these new firms were introducing products that would create new pathways for accessing services in the digital age. Because these new layers, such as browsers, would disintermediate Microsoft's control, it had engaged in a scheme to kill them off. The government's lawsuit ultimately prevented Microsoft from further centralizing control and paved the way for small, small scrappy firms like Google to enter and grow. 
antitrust action had added much needed oxygen to the market, spurring decades of innovation and creating enormous wealth, including here in Silicon Valley. So retur to return to Bill Gurley's thesis, government has in fact been a key ingredient in Silicon Valley's success. Antitrust enforcement and competition policy have helped create the conditions for fair and honest competition, ensuring that today's scrappy startups have the opportunity to become tomorrow's giants. In other words, the key question is not whether government shapes markets, but how it does so and towards what ends. For the last 40 years, across both Democratic and Republican administrations, government policy made a sharp shift from promoting open competitive markets in favor of enabling concentration. The thinking went that concentrated markets were almost always more efficient and delivered lower prices for consumers. As a result, today, a handful of large incumbents increasingly set the terms and rules of digital markets. We hear from startups and entrepreneurs about how their access to markets is increasingly mediated by a handful of giants. These gatekeepers can use their power to pick winners and losers such that a startup's success can depend on the arbitrary whims of an existing incumbent. Research suggests that incumbent firms may also be capturing large amounts of innovative capacity through hoarding talent or acquiring firms for the express purpose of killing off competition. One recent study found that after being hired by a large company, inventors produce six to 11% fewer innovations than they did at smaller firms. Another study showed that in sectors where dominant platforms made frequent acquisitions, there was a drop off in venture capital investment in startups suggesting that incumbents were creating kill zones where new ventures were not worth funding. Entrepreneurs tell us that they often see being acquired by a big firm as their only viable exit option. While one in two firms exited by IPO in the 1990s, only about one in 10 do so today. Part of this has to do with factors outside of antitrust and competition. But this fact can mean that increased amounts of venture capital go to companies that have a chance of being acquired by existing firms rather than replace them, which can short circuit the innovation potential of the entire ecosystem. Fewer pathways to commercialization can also mean that there are fewer buyers to negotiate with, leading to lower valuations and less favorable deal terms. After decades of lax antitrust enforcement and competition policy, under the Biden administration, there is a renewed bipartisan interest to once again use these tools to create opportunities for entrepreneurs and unleash the US economy's full potential. If we succeed, more Americans will be able to go from tinkering in a garage to having a shot at becoming the next giant. At the FTC, we've been firing on all cylinders to enable the conditions that let new innovations, startups, and ideas take root and thrive. First, we're taking on coercive gatekeepers. In partnership with 17 state HEs, the FTC this fall sued Amazon for deploying tactics to deprive rival platforms of the scale needed to meaningfully compete against Amazon. Our lawsuit charges that Amazon use these tactics to promote its, to protect its monopoly power from competitive checks while raising prices and degrading services for both the tens of millions of families that shop on Amazon's platform and the hundreds of thousands of sellers that use Amazon to reach them. In a competitive market, a monopoly that hiked prices and degraded services would create an opening for rivals to come in, draw business, grow, and compete. But our lawsuit alleges that Amazon's unlawful monopolistic strategy closed off that possibility with the public paying as a result. This lawsuit is one of several the federal and state enforcers have filed against dominant digital platforms. Each case differs, but at their core, these cases tell a story about firms that initially enjoyed success through building services that users wanted and outcompeting rivals, but then ultimately resorted to monopolistic tactics to pull up the ladder behind them. At a general level, these cases are designed to unclog the arteries of competition and ensure that the next set of innovators are not locked out of the market. Second, we're looking to ensure that companies aren't blocking competition through the use of non-compete clauses. In January, we proposed a rule that would largely eliminate non-compete clauses from employment contracts. Our proposal builds on extensive research showing that non-competes undermine product markets as well as labor markets, limiting the ability of entrepreneurs and startups to enter and compete. 
At the FTC, for example, we've heard from firms who had identified a market opportunity, secured funding, and entered only to find out that they couldn't grow because the relevant talent pool was all locked up through non-competes by incumbents. California, of course, has had a, long had a policy that non-competes are not enforceable in the state, a policy that some say was key to Silicon Valley's growth as the epicenter of America's tech industry. Technological advances benefit from the free flow of talent and knowledge between companies and startups, and our proposal recognizing that, recognizes that tying down workers through non-competes risks blocking this progress. Third, we're scanning the horizon to ensure that the FTC is protecting open markets even in areas of new and nascent technologies. Much is uncertain about what the long-term impact of large language models and AI will look like, but it's clear that these technologies could potentially transform industries across the economy just as the rise of the internet did nearly 40 years ago. Just like, just like back then, this technology has already seen a huge influx of capital with promise to grow our economy and catalyze major advances. The FTC's role here is to, have an is to scrutinize any bottlenecks. History shows that firms that capture control over key inputs or distribution channels can use their power to exploit these bottlenecks, extort customers, and maintain their monopolies. The role of antitrust is to guard against these bottlenecks achieved through illegal tactics and ensure that dominant firms are not unlawfully abusing their monopoly power to block innovation and competition. The agency is taking a close look across the AI stack to understand the extent of competition across the various layers and sublayers. We are examining whether dominant firms with control over key inputs like cloud infrastructure and access to GPUs may be able to charge excessive prices or impose coercive terms. And we've launched a new office of technology to bring on data engineers, data scientists, and AI specialists to ensure that our skill sets are keeping pace with evolving markets. We're eager to sharpen our thinking on the various opportunities and potential obstacles for competition across AI markets and are eager to be learning from players within the ecosystem. Much is uncertain about what the future of this technology will look like. But the FTC has made clear that there is no AI exemption from the laws on the books and will be clear-eyed in ensuring that claims of innovation are not used as cover for lawbreaking. Our history also shows that maintaining open, fair, and competitive markets, especially at technological inflection points, is a key way to ensure that America benefits from the innovation that these tools may catalyze. And we'll continue our work to encourage a vibrant playing field where pioneers and tinkerers can bring their ideas to market and help unleash the dynamism and prosperity that has been key to America's success. Thanks so much. Okay, so I'll ask two or three questions. I have plenty more that I can ask, but there are a lot of people here who I'm sure have tons of expertise in these areas. So I'll just, and, but if, when you do ask a question, if you do, please identify yourself and you know, where you're from or that kind of thing. Um, so thanks for those remarks. So maybe we can just start right off and talk a little bit about one or more setbacks um, that the FTC has faced in court, um, even when it brings cases that seem to have merit. Um, and I guess would be curious to have your view on that. To some extent, the changes that are underway at FTC have been pretty significant in a pretty short period of time. A lot of the judges have been working on these cases for decades. So do you think that reforming antitrust law in the way you envision might ultimately require uh, legislation, more legislation than through the courts? So we brought a whole series of cases, a lot of which are still pending. Um, on the merger front, we've had close to 20 abandonments by firms. That means the FTC either brought a lawsuit or investigated and firms dropped the merger, uh, including in some really important areas like semiconductors and the defense industry. Uh, so uh, in 2021 and early 2022, the FTC, for example, uh, brought a lawsuit challenging NVIDIA's attempted acquisition of ARM. Uh, and Lockheed's attempted acquisition of Aerojet, uh, both of what, which were what are known as vertical mergers, so mergers not between direct competitors, but between firms that are in the same supply chain. Um, vertical merger enforcement is an area where we had seen some dormancy over the last few decades, but in both of these instances, the firms walked away. Um, two merger cases where we have had setbacks, uh, one was the FTC's efforts to block Meta's acquisition of Within, 
um, and the other was the FTC's effort to block Microsoft's acquisition of Activision. Um, the latter is still on appeal, so we'll see what happens at the Ninth Circuit. Um, and look, you know, we only bring cases because we want to win. Uh, right. When we don't win, we're disappointed. Uh, we look closely at the opinion and try to figure out where did we fall short and what could we do better next time. Um, the meta within opinion was interesting because we alleged a potential competition theory, uh, which, uh, you know, the company was arguing this doctrine doesn't apply in digital markets. It really only applies to smokestack industries. Uh, and the judge firmly rejected that. He said, no, potential competition is alive and well, including in digital markets, uh, including in markets that are very fast moving. Uh, the judge ruled for us on market definition, uh, which is you know, a really key part of the inquiry. Um, and so even though we weren't successful in that case and regretted that we weren't, uh, we thought the opinion provided significant clarity of the law, including how co potential competition doctrine applies in digital markets and also um, created a roadmap for enforcers to succeed going forward. So you know, at the end of the day, we thought there was still some net benefit there. Um, we also have a whole bunch of uh, conduct cases outside of the merger context that are still pending, some in digital markets, uh, some in contexts like the pesticide market. Uh, so one of the lawsuits the FTC brought la last year alleged that um, dominant pesticide manufacturers, uh, Syngenta and Corteva, had used a whole set of unlawful tactics to block generics from the market in ways that led farmers to overpay by billions of dollars and ultimately led the food consuming public to also carry that excessive cost. So, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion about the FTC ends up focusing just on tech, but our jurisdiction is much broader from, you know, food and retail to healthcare. Uh, and so we're focused on, on all of those sectors as well. Great, okay, thanks for that. So we're gonna talk a lot about big tech, but I just wanna ask one question about the largest sector of the economy, the healthcare sector. That's one that um, I've been studying for a while. And there's been, uh, basically, in the US, we spend much more as a share of our GDP than any other country on the planet. And part of that, studies have shown, has to do with prices being significantly higher, but it's complicated. The healthcare sector is super complicated. Uh, and you talked a little bit about vertical versus horizontal integration. There's been work over the years on, let's say, hospital mergers or health insurer mergers, but then there's a lot of vertical stuff. So can you talk a little bit about how the FTC is right now thinking about the healthcare sector and you know, the activ enforcement activity there and consumer protection? Yeah, happy to. And I should note that not only does the U.S. pay more, but the studies show that we get worse outcomes despite paying more, right? Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a whole set of uh, problems in the market. Um, so the FTC has long focused on healthcare in areas like hospital consolidation. Uh, we're continuing that work, but we've also been squarely focused on drug pricing. And so we have a whole set of work looking at where are instances where anti-competitive practices and violations of the antitrust laws may be contributing to higher drug prices. Uh, one area that we're scrutinizing, um, which is public, is the role of PBMs. So these are pharmacy benefit managers. They're kind of middlemen in the pharmaceutical supply chain. And there's been um, reporting and, and claims that um, suggest that the rebates that we see between drug manufacturers and the PBMs may be incentivizing the PBMs to put on their formularies the drugs that are most lucrative for them rather than the drugs that may be most affordable for Americans. So even in instances where you've seen competition, you've seen generics, you've seen some of these biosimilars enter the market, they may not actually have market access because the PBM's incentives may be distorted. Um, so that's an area that we're looking at. Um, more generally, we've also been looking at, and this is work that preceded my arrival at the agency, um, instances in which uh, firms, uh, drug firms may be using um, or seeking to extend the life of their patents illegitimately. So the agency has long had work around what are known as pay for delay agreements, uh, where companies were basically pay off uh, potential entrants and, and make sure they're able to kind of secure uh, a monopoly over the market for a, a, a longer time that they would otherwise be entitled under the patent laws. Um, we also recently announced that we will be scrutinizing uh, the Orange Book, uh, which is basically a repository overseen by the FDA uh, where firms are able to list their patents, and if they list them, they get kind of an automatic stay on any competition. Uh, but we're worried that firms may be illegitimately listing patents in the Orange Book, 
uh, including for you know, all sorts of device patents that may be illegitimately inflating prices. Uh, so we've made clear that we view that as within our jurisdiction and we'll be um, potentially you know, claiming that some of those practices may be an unfair method of competition. Um, so that's just some area of work. Uh, on the hospital side, I'll say a lot of the FTC's work historically has been focused on local hospital market consolidation. So two hospitals within the same region, you know, merging and, and what that will do in terms of eliminating local competition. Um, I think we've seen over the last uh, you know, decade or so hospitals relying more on some of these national plays. So we're seeing the merger of you know, major systems across states that might not necessarily have geographic overlap. Um, so that's something that we're aware is happening. It's not something that the agency has um, traditionally had the tools to look at, but we're getting some evidence that there may be competition implications there um, and so are, are taking a closer look. Oh, great, okay. So my third and final question before opening it up. Uh, so on Friday last week, many of the people here know that we had an all-day policy forum on the future of globalization. Um, and we talked a fair amount in that during the day about national security issues. And so I'm curious as to whether uh, national security concerns play a significant role in the FTC's thinking about how optimally uh, to regulate big tech. Uh, for example, if we regulate in a certain way, that may differentially benefit companies uh, in various other countries that are the focus of, you know, let's say, adversaries, potential adversaries. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, happy to. So there are some transactions where we have uh, overlapping jurisdiction with the Defense Department. Uh, that's primarily over certain types of defense industry mergers. So when we did our review of Lockheed Aerojet, uh, the DOD independently reviewed that and determined that there probably would be national security implications. And so that's one way that these things can factor into our assessment. Um, I think more generally, though, uh, these concerns aren't new. Uh, so at various points over the last century, when DOJ was scrutinizing AT&T, for example, uh, you know, the antitrust division would say, oh, there's an antitrust problem here. But the Department of Defense would come in and say, actually, we can't break up AT&T because it will hurt our national security. And so I think we've traditionally seen some of these arguments be made. Um, historically, there have been key inflection points where we decided not to protect our national champions um, you know, in ways that protected monopoly power, but instead enforced antitrust and promoted competition. And I think there are at least some examples that suggest that that was really key for unleashing innovation. So in the AT&T example, the government ended up breaking up AT&T in 1982. Uh, that you know, helped loosen up certain markets downstream. Uh, we've seen that you know, Japan, for example, around that time instead doubled down on its national champions. And we saw you know, innovation gaps in terms of what they were able to achieve. So historically, there have been um, suggestions that actually doubling down on competition rather than protecting incumbent monopolies is what, over the long term, will position us best internationally and on the global stage. Um, I think in the tech context, there have also been some interesting, uh, you know, interesting arguments and research suggesting that uh, there are ways in which consolidation in the big tech space can actually also leave us vulnerable from a national security perspective. Uh, so Ganesh uh, Sitaraman, uh, who's a scholar, um, wrote an article that basically laid out why, if you are just looking at national security concerns, you may actually want to inject competition here rather than doubling down. So I think it's a, it's a live debate, but historically, we've kind of chosen to go the competition route, and I think it's served us well. OK, great. All right, so with that, I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience. And so let's see. We have here, we've got a question right here. And please identify yourself, your affiliation. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Kirtan Kinney. My education exp and experience is actually as an AI engineer, but my affiliation with Stanford is that I'm a recent alum of both the business school and the public policy program. My question is based off of some of the comments you made towards the end of your talk around uh, the AI uh, ecosystem in general. Many of the cases that you filed have like long histories and fact of fact patterns of how these companies have operated and so forth. In the AI space, even as somebody who's uh, technically skilled, I find it difficult to keep up with the, uh, with the research that's coming day by day. What are the tools that you see the FTC has as, as its dispo at, at its disposal in such a rapidly evolving space? And how do you think about the timing or how to deploy them in order to make sure that this ecosystem remains open and develops in a healthy way? 
so we're primarily in, in learning mode right now. Uh, at a very basic level, we want to make sure that we fully understand the kind of anatomy of the stack and understand what are the key properties of all the various layers and key inputs. Uh, it's no secret that in, serious, in certain layers, we already see some of that concentration and there's a risk that some of the existing incumbents could use their control over those inputs to undermine innovation and competition. Um, some of the tools that the FTC has in addition to its lawsuits is um, information gathering. So we have something called our, our 6B authority under the FTC Act, and it allows us to do uh, deep dives into markets even outside of a law enforcement context. Um, we also routinely kind of open up public dockets, invite comments. Uh, earlier this year, we launched an inquiry into cloud computing. Uh, this is an area where anecdotally, we've been hearing concerns, including from uh, the business and enterprise community about um, how some of the practices of the incumbent cloud computing providers could be you know, creating lock-in, creating resiliency issues. Um, so that's something that we studied. We had a workshop on uh, last month. We also had a roundtable hearing from creators uh, many of whom have been quite vocal about concerns relating to how some of these models are ingesting their life's creations in ways where they don't really have recourse and they worry that you know, their intellectual property is being diluted. Um, so we had a roundtable where we had you know, uh, authors, uh, illustrators, uh, fashion models, really people across the creative industry uh, just to learn from them. You know, what's happening? What are they seeing? Uh, all of them interestingly said, you know, we're not anti-AI, we're not anti-progress. We already see how some of these tools uh, could actually equip us and empower us. We're just worried about how some of the existing uses where there isn't really any consent being granted by these creators to use their data um, could really be creating distortions in the marketplace. So, you know, that's something that we looked at and are continuing to look at. Um, so there are a whole set of tools outside of a law enforcement context that we can scrutinize. We do also feel an obligation to just be timely because I think we've seen in some of these markets how harm can really um, accrue and accumulate in a way that there are feedback loops and that can reinforce uh, a firm's position in ways that really make acting early uh, even more important. So it's, it's a balance for us. Okay, great. Additional questions uh, right here. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Thomas Tao. I'm a PhD candidate in political economy at the business school. So uh, my question concerns your uh, famous paper, Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. Uh, you made some really great argument on how the judicial philosophy concerning antitrust in America is based on, often based on this narrowly defined consumer welfare, which is uh, based on pricing. But for people who really care about consumer welfare, like my question is, what else do you think should be included in the analysis of consumer welfare? Is it just that we are focusing too much on the short-term consumer welfare, or, or do you think there should be other elements than pricing uh, when we consider consumer welfare? Thank you. I think it's both. I think you know we need to be smarter about figuring out what um, can be a proxy for long-term price effects in ways that might not be visible in the short term. Uh, but we also need to think more broadly about you know different dimensions of, of quality, uh, different dimensions of innovation. Uh, one of the claims uh, we note in the Facebook antitrust case is that there was a harm to privacy. So once Facebook was able to acquire uh, monopoly power, it was able to hurt users through degrading their privacy uh, in ways that they didn't really have as many outside options. Um, that was something that the judge ratified and acknowledged that you know, harm to privacy is cognizable under the antitrust statutes. Um, we also want to make sure that we're using the antitrust laws to protect everybody. Uh, that includes consumers, but it also includes just trading partners more generally. So suppliers, producers, um, merchants, um, as well as workers. And so a whole bunch of the FTC's work has been focused on making sure that labor markets are also competitive and that workers are able to benefit from uh, the competition that the antitrust laws are designed to protect. Um, that includes our non-competes work uh, and the revised merger guidelines that we just put out. Uh, we actually talk about for the first time ever um, how we're going to assess mergers, not just from a product market perspective, but also from a labor market perspective. So that's something that we're focused on as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got a question 
right here, and then, uh, then, then you, yeah, right here. Hi, thanks for your comments, Chair Khan. I was actually at Bill Gurley's talk, and I think <laughs> my takeaway was his comment that regulatory capture is the key component, which we see happening more and more now as AI companies ramp up their lobbying. Um, I'm a JDMA candidate and a researcher at the Center for Research on Foundation Models on campus. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the importance of FTC's information gathering function. Uh, companies often talk about how sharing more information about, for instance, the large language models they develop would put them at a competitive disadvantage or would increase the risk of these, uh, of these models by allowing more people to develop them. In a recent study we put out, uh, the Foundation Model Transparency Index, we found that companies release only about half of the relevant information that researchers or that the public would need to know to hold companies to account. So for the most part, the FTC's information gathering um, efforts, uh, we, have, we can have access to non-public information, but we have an obligation to keep that information non-public. So we, as a general matter, can't really take non-public confidential information and then just unleash it into the public, um, which on the one hand is, is really useful because it lets us really look under the hood in a way that isn't compromised by some of those concerns. Um, but you're right, and, and we've also heard concerns from academics and researchers and others that they're not getting um, a full look at what's really going on in ways that could impair the ability of outsiders to fully vet and make sure that certain protections are being taken. Um, the White House earlier this week put out an executive order on AI that really you know, lays out a whole of government charge for agencies uh, across the board to be kind of using their tools to make sure this technology is gonna be safe and secure and we're kind of harnessing the innovative potential while not exposing Americans to harm. Uh, there are all sorts of issues outside of the FTC's purview relating to safety and security and trust and ethics. Um, that other agencies will be taking the lead on. Uh, we're really focused on the competition issues that I talked about, um, as well as our consumer protection efforts. So we, in addition to preventing unfair methods of competition, uh, police unfair deceptive practices. In practice, that means things like fraud and scams. Uh, we're already seeing in our consumer complaint database um, uh, reports of how some of these AI tools are being used to turbocharge fraud since they can be used to kind of turbocharge these scams uh, much more cheaply, much more quickly, and on a much broader scale. Um, and so that's something that we're monitoring closely to, to figure out, you know, how do we make sure we uh, stay ahead of the curve here? One of the bigger questions I think right now is also, uh, what is the right liability regime here? Um, I think historically we've seen that when you're just focused on some of the downstream uses, from an enforcement perspective, that can mean you're playing whack-a-mole. And so, for example, uh, the FTC, you know, historically has policed robocalls. Uh, robocalls are endemic. Uh, there are certain limits in, in how we can go upstream, but one way we've been doing that is going after VoIP providers who sometimes are facilitating the robocalls. Because if we just go after the robocalls, they're just you know, fly-by-night actors, you go over here and they emerge over there. And I think we face similar questions about what does that look like in the AI context when you have fraud. I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it's a really ripe question. One thing that I think is really important is making sure that the liability regime lines up with the actors that have the information and power and resources to be policing those efforts. I think one thing I'm wary of is some type of regime where that type of responsibility is being outsourced to civil society or under-resourced enforcers rather than those precautions being taken on the front end by the actors that are best positioned to um, you know, take those actions. So I think these are just really, really salient questions that we're still figuring out. Okay, question right over here. Uh, I don't know if we've got a mic person right here. Yeah, great. Hi, thank you so much, Tarkon, for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, my name is Adriana. I am a second year undergraduate student studying public policy. Um, my question relates to the professor's first question relating to um, the role and increasing role of legislation playing um, with the FTC. And so specifically, I'm wondering, you know, based on your experience, 
Is there something that you wish policymakers, legislators knew, or maybe a particular approach that you wish they took to complement the FTC's efforts, um, consumer protection, addressing um, the markets, et cetera? So two things are top of mind. Um, one is that the FTC currently is limited in the remedies that it can get. So they, uh, before I arrived at the agency, they got an adverse decision from the Supreme Court, which basically nullified what had been the agency's primary path for getting money back for consumers. So we're now in a position where it's much harder if consumers are defrauded or consumers are charged kind of monopoly prices illegitimately, uh, the FTC is much more challenged in being able to get back those ill-gotten gains. Practically, what that means is that it's easier for lawbreakers to profit from lawbreaking, right? Because if you're making money through these illegal tactics, but we're not able to get that illegitimately obtained money back for people, um, that can create a real deterrence problem, right? Because then you can be incentivized to engage in the lawbreaking, get away with it as long as you can, and at the end of the day, all that might happen is the agency says, stop doing this, a court says, stop doing it. So I think uh, one of the biggest changes we need from Congress is um, greater remedial authority and greater ability for the FTC to actually get money back for people when they've been defrauded. Um, the other thing I would note is that it's become very, very, very expensive to engage in antitrust litigation. Uh, that's true for plaintiffs. That's true for defendants. Um, one reason it's become expensive is because antitrust analysis has become much more dependent on certain types of economic analysis. And so as a practical matter, if you're bringing a case, the defendants are always going to hire an economic expert. The plaintiff then has to hire an economic expert. These experts are very expensive. Uh, the agency spends millions of dollars uh, on outlays to these economists. And it would be one thing, <laughs> it, would be, it, it would be one thing if we thought that that was actually helping judges get to the right place. Uh, but increasingly, we've been having courts who say, you know, each of you has a fancy economist you all kind of cancel each other out because the judge is not a specialist. And so the judge is really going to go by you know, which industry executive he found more credible on the stand. And so you have a situation where the government is paying millions of dollars to these economists, and it's not actually helping the judge reach their decision. Uh, so I see that as, as a problem in the system and would want, <laughs> which I know might upset some economists, but uh, from, a, <laughs> from a government resources perspective, uh, would want Congress to figure out you know, how to align what's required uh, to bring these antitrust cases with what's actually being useful to the courts. OK. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question right here. Uh. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dhaval Shah. I'm a Stanford CS alumni. Uh, thank you very much for the fantastic talk you gave, uh, so clear uh, and articulate, and the nice question and answers with Mark. Uh, the question I had is about the point you made about um, uh, protecting um, competition by not allowing a lot of startups to be acquired in the wrong way. Uh, and reducing competition that way, you elaborated on that. What about the flip side of it? Some of the circles here in the Bay Area or the Valley talk about going too much in that direction. If you go after too many of them, then the incentive for VCs to fund a startup to get an exit, uh, except private equity and IPO, to get an acquisition exit, incentive reduces. So how do you make the trade-off? Because if you do too much of that, you may go overboard and uh, reduce acquisitions, and hence, incentive to fund also from the other side. So how do you figure that out? Yeah, I had a chance to sit down with some uh, VC folks and investors earlier, and, and they raised their point. And it's a good question. I mean, look, from an enforcement perspective, as I was sharing with them, at the moment, 98% of all deal making goes through without even a second question being asked by the agency, right? So the, the segment of deals where we're talking about you know, government issuing a second request or ultimately bringing an enforcement action is a very, very narrow slice. Uh, we're you know, taking steps to provide more clarity about the types of deals that we believe pose legal problems and those that don't. Uh, we released this past summer draft merger guidelines where we lay out you know, what are the analytical frameworks that we'll be using to assess if there's potentially an antitrust problem. Um, and there's more that we can be doing, I'm sure, in that vein and would be you know, eager for suggestions. Um, I think more generally, though, we've also heard concerns about how when there are very few exit options, that that can also affect and, and reduce the acquired firm's uh, leverage and negotiating power 
resulting in dampened deal valuations, uh, less leverage to get more favorable deal terms. And so at the end of the day, even ultimately if what you want is an exit through acquisition, having more potential acquirers is good for the startups and good for the founders. And so I think ideally, you know, that's an ecosystem that we would trend more towards. Okay, additional questions. We got one in the back row. And I should clarify, economic analysis is useful to antitrust. <laughs> Just, was, uh, thank, you for, thank you for I, that, Chair <laughs> <comment. I was laughs> I, <laughs> I think we've just seen the pendulum swing so that there can be just an arms race uh, in a way that's not fully constructive. So I think we just need to be a bit more discerning about what's the economic analysis that's actually probative and actually helping us understand the competition implications uh, and what's the kind of arms race that is not really providing courts more clarity. Let's get that one, though, in the story. But anyway, <laughs> but yeah, back, she, yeah, question back here. Hi, Lena. Um, so this might be sort of long, maybe not, but um, thank you so much for your time so far. Identify if you're so Wait. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm, a, I'm Lydia Wang. I am a fourth year PhD student in accounting at the GSB. Um, thank you so much for being here and for your time. I've, I've learned a lot so far. Um, so my questions have to do with um, the arguments you made at the beginning of the talk about how competition, free and fair competition is necessary for innovation and how if we don't have competition, uh, free and fair competition, then startups can't, don't have the opportunity to become giants. And um, I guess if the goal of all of this antitrust discussion is to stimulate innovation, um, I wanted to ask about two of the points in that argument you made at the beginning of your talk. So for the first point, the, the point is that or the point or the assumption is that competition is necessary for innovation. So I might ask whether one might argue that monopolies might actually help innovation. For example, um, the big te digital tech platforms nowadays have a wealth of digital personal data on people that represent um, a lot of the nation and even the globe. Um, and they have this wealth of data that startups don't have access to. And these big tech companies can use this wealth of data to their advantage to glean customer demand insights and might actually help optimally design and create innovative products and have an advantage over startups in terms of creating these more, um, in terms of creating innovation. And um, the second point that I wanted to ask about was the, point about, or the assumption that startups' um, motivation to innovate is driven by their wanting to become giants. Um, so this is kind of related to your comment, um, but how do, we want, how do we know that startups actually want to grow into giants? Might it actually be possible that entrepreneurs start companies with the goal of selling them to larger companies, where the larger the company, the larger the potential return to the entrepreneur or the um, better the exit, and thus might it actually be beneficial to have larger and more monopolistic companies to sell to. And for example, um, maybe entrepreneurs would actually be daunted by the prospect of growing into giants um, as a sort of barrier to entry mentality and um, be deterred from starting companies or doing certain types of innovation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Very how, about, how about it? <laughs> Very interesting question. I mean, on the first one, you know, this, there's a long-standing debate uh, in the economics literature between Arrow and Jupiter about, you know, what are the underlying market structure conditions that best favor innovation, right? Jupiter said it's monopoly. Uh, Arrow said it's competition. Uh, in addition to the argument you mentioned in the modern economy, right, one of the arguments was, well, if monopolies are able to extract monopoly rents, earn monopoly profits, they're going to be the ones that are best able to reinvest in, and produce innovation. And this is where I think the key question comes back to what types of innovation. So as I understand it, you know, the economic literature um, distinguishes between breakthrough innovations and incremental innovations. And it's certainly true that sometimes monopolies may be better positioned to do the incremental type innovation. But the research suggests that the types of breakthrough innovations, the kind of paradigm shifting, platform upending innovation, has historically come through competitive markets, through entrepreneurs, through startups. Um, there can be a whole bunch of reasons for that. But I think, you know, as I view the research, there seem to be huge benefits to 
the competition producing the types of breakthrough innovations. Um, on the second question, you know, we at the FTC are primarily law enforcers. Uh, we're not policymakers, and so we're not kind of picking and choosing what are the best, um, you know, market structures. Uh, we have a mandate to enforce the antitrust laws, right? Congress passed a set of laws that said, as a general matter, we're going to favor competition over monopoly. And here, FTC and antitrust division go enforce these laws. So that's really what we view as, as our mandate. Um, if there are certain countervailing benefits to monopolies, Congress can and does kind of give other agencies the ability to you know, pr protect monopolies, create monopolies, create certain safe harbors. Um, that's really not our job. We're really focused on um, the competition aspect. OK, great. Additional uh, questions. I've got a question. OK, here. Let's go here, and then to you. Thank you, David Globe, GSB 94. Just to, uh, you were talking about uh, government resources and just a high level question to orient folks. If you could explain uh, how jurisdiction works between the Justice Department and your agency and how a topic like LLMs gets reviewed. Is it done twice? Does one of you decide to take it on? It'd be very helpful, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And the short of it is uh, it's an imperfect science. Um, some of it builds on just historically what has an agency looked at. So uh, even in an area like healthcare, the Justice Department had looked at health insurers, whereas the FTC has looked at hospitals. Um, and so there's just historically a split in jurisdiction. Uh, there are some areas where the FTC's jurisdiction is more limited than the Justice Department. So for example, we don't have authority to review common carriers. So you know, major transportation mergers, be it in railroads or airlines, go to DOJ. Um, similarly, you know, agriculture markets go to DOJ. Um, especially with some of the newer technologies and newer markets, um, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, we are in real time having discussions. You know, there's a new deal came through. It's in a market that neither of us has really looked at. Who has the resources to look at it? Does somebody have existing expertise that intimately relates to it? Um, so it's really an imperfect science. Um, I should also note that you know the DOJ has criminal enforcement authority, uh, which the FTC doesn't have. The FTC has um, what's known as its Section 5 authority, which kind of goes beyond the four corners of the Sherman and Clayton Act. So there are certain areas in which we are more clearly playing a complementary role rather than direct substitutes. Um, so it really just depends on the specific matter. Okay, great. We've got a question right here. <clears throat> Hi, Lena. I'm Shail Kumar. I'm president of uh, Nalanda 2.0, our higher education focused policy uh, organization. Uh, my question is actually on your career, which is both aspirational and inspirational. In fact, I met an eighth grader in this room who came just to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So what's your, uh, what can you share about lessons from your career that might be helpful to students, aspiring students, not only in this room, but around the world? Yeah, it's a heavy question, but uh, look, I think stay curious. Um, you know, I was an outsider to my field, and I think that gave me the ability to ask certain questions that otherwise would have been taboo. Uh, I remember a more senior scholar said that, you know, if you had been uh, an antitrust scholar, you never would have been able to write the paper that you did because the questions that you were asking, you would have wondered if you would have been laughed out of the room. And so I think uh, you know, it really can show the value of somebody coming to a field with fresh eyes and really asking the questions that are ripe for revisiting, uh, but some of the existing incumbents may not be asking. So uh, stay curious, have an open mind. Um, you know, I got into this work through somewhat of a back door where I originally wanted to be a business journalist. Um, so got my start you know, doing deep dives into all sorts of sectors of the economy and talking to business people um, and seeing that there was often a gap between how businesses were seeing market power and monopoly power be exercised and how certain antitrust theories were assuming that that power would or wouldn't be exercised. And it was kind of seeing that delta firsthand, like what was happening in the real world and what these theories were saying, uh, that really inspired me to get into this work. But I think it's a really important and exciting moment for antitrust and competition. Uh, the FTC and DOJ are really on the front lines of this, but we're seeing an effort across government uh, to really be kind of reharnessing these competition tools. So, uh, you know, I think it's a great time for, for public service as well. 
Great, okay, uh, question over, gosh, there's like a lot of, I, I don't know how to play, I'm gonna randomize this here. Uh, but you were the first person that I saw, right here in dark blue, yeah, dark blue, yeah. I'm sorry, the, no, 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 this, this, oh, well, anyway. I've done this, this happened a couple times, anyway, he was the first, I, anyway, it's, oh. there's like, so it's a hard, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not everyone is I'm sorry. gonna get to have their, okay, go. Um, hi, Trikhan, uh, I'm Sandeep, I am a Master of International Policy student, it's formerly at Meta right before this, um, big fan even at Meta of, you know, what you did to my boss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us were. Um, <laughs> Question I had while I was there and listening to you. Um, at Meta, I worked on Digital Services Act compliance and how we worked with Europe in general. Um, how would you say the United States' lack of comprehensive data protection and privacy as a human right, and that codified into federal regulation, federal law, how does that lack kind of impede or limit the kind of uh, antitrust enforcement you bring against big tech. And assuming that one day comes, you know, God, God willing, in our, in our lifetimes, um, how might that impact innovation going forward? Because so much of big tech's business model is built on monetizing human privacy and data in a way that individuals don't actually have a way of monetizing or taking ownership of currently. So the FTC, through its consumer protection work, is very active in the data privacy space. We have a whole set of enforcement actions looking at um, geolocation data, uh, health data, just the ways in which people's sensitive data may be misused. And uh, you know we've been using our traditional authorities. Uh, but you're absolutely right that there isn't a kind of standalone data protection or data privacy regime. Uh, for antitrust, what that means is that um, Generally speaking, the way that antitrust and non-antitrust areas of regulation interact is that these other parts of regulation help determine what are the dimensions that firms can or cannot compete on. So as a general matter, the fact that we don't have robust privacy laws means that firms are not necessarily, um, they may be more incentivized to compete as a race to the bottom from a data privacy perspective rather than a race to the top. Whereas if we had um, you know, data privacy laws that limited what types of data could be collected, you wouldn't see necessarily competition on the dimension of who can most surveil their users, right? And so I think it would help just determine and potentially limit some dimensions from being competed on and, and incentivize others. And I would say just more generally, these other kind of regulatory regimes just help determine whether you're going to see a race to the top or a race to the bottom. And so um, that's one of the ways I see the impact. Now, even though we're at 6.01, I'm going to allow one more question, so no pressure. And I'm going to try to get a sense of like imperfect information. Whose question is best? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. You, were, you raised it a long time ago, and I, I was over that side. So let's, let's go to you. So no pressure. Better be good. <laughs> Hi, Konstantin, uh, Konstantin Medvedovsky, TIG. Uh, Chair Cotton, you, asked, you raised earlier the fact pattern of a, a dominant firm buying an innovative firm and that research showing that those you know, employees then go on to innovate less you know, at post acquisition. I'm curious, can you sort of elaborate on what the, what the fact pattern is that you know, uh, would lead to heightened, high, a heightened risk of a, a loss of innovation uh, in that scenario? And as a follow-up, what if any remedies uh, would be available for that? Like a, a commitment to spend a certain amount of money on R&D, like, so, like maintain a certain level of employment, anything like that, uh, uh, would any of that remedy that sort of concern? Yeah, it's a good question and, and highly recommend the paper. Um, I don't remember off the top if the paper kind of offered kind of causal explanations for why they, they, they made the empirical observation. I don't know if they then went and you know, offered explanations for why it was happening. Um, you know, I can imagine a whole bunch of potential reasons, one of just which are the change in incentives. Uh, so if firms already have a very lucrative line of business, they may not be interested in creating new products that are cannibalizing. Uh, and rendering obsolete their existing investments. Um, I think more generally, you know, these can be relevant questions for us as part of our merger analysis. So if we're seeing you know, deal documents that are saying, hey, let's buy up this firm and then that'll allow us to slash R&D spending, 
that right now we're having to do because we're having to compete against this firm, that would be an important indicia for us to figure out, okay, these firms are clearly competing. This competition is spurring innovation, is spurring R&D. The deal docs themselves are saying, hey, we're just gonna be able to slash R&D. That would be probative for us. Um, so that's one way that it, it, it could apply, but I imagine it could also be uh, relevant you know, in, in section two lawsuits and, and how you're kind of you know, alleging different forms of harm. Wow, okay, so we're a few minutes over. So thank you so much, Shara Khan, for be Lena, for being here. Thank you so much, and please join me, thank you. And we've got more events coming down the pike at CEPR, Albert Park on November 15th, Natasha Sarin on December 11th, and Emily Oster on January 29th. So we hope to see you more soon, and the summit in early March. So hope to see you again soon. Have a great night. Thank you so much.